And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the beer flows steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This episode is sponsored by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit www.sans.org to learn more. And by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And also sponsored by Black Squirrel, pen test networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Good. But for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit blacksquirrel.io for more information. Now, fire up a packet capture. Pour yourself a beer or perhaps craft a Martinez. Uh, and give the intern control of your botnet. Here's your host, a man who hasn't shaved since 19... No, wait, that's me. Uh... <laughs> Paul Asadorian. <laughs> that was wonderful introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Welcome to this edition of Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. We're broadcasting live from the Security Weekly studios. That's right. We're here in Warwick, Rhode Island. I'm very excited to be here, as always, just coming off uh, a short trip to Orlando. Uh, Mr. Jack Daniel is kind enough to join us in the studio. Yes, I finally made it back from two weeks that were unpleasant. I subscribe to the Jack Daniel method of beard maintenance. So anytime someone compliments my beard, I'm always, I always give them the Mine's nice props. I, give little, you props. I, I, like, was, I, I was wearing a, a pullover hoodie and mine now has enough yeah. static to charge a small city for a week. That's right. It, it still looks good. It still looks good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll talk about cowboy magic later. Yeah. And how magical. Cowboy <laughs> it's magical. Magical it is. Uh, on uh, the lines via Skype. We got some regular hosts that are joining us this evening. First from North Carolina, Mr. Joff Dyer. Yeah, hey Paul, how are you? Good to be here Good. again. I love how I introduce you from North Carolina and you don't have the right accent from North Carolina, Joff. He, so, he totally sounds like North Carolina. Yeah, yes, way I'm more like North Carolina. North Carolina, not <laughs> South. <laughs> and from lovely flooded Boston, we've got Mr. Not Kevin. Welcome, Not Kevin. Hey, Paul. How's it going? Good. And you don't have much of a, a Bostonian accent either, oh, huh, Kevin? No, not at all. Because you're not from Boston. I'm not, no. And people tell me that every day. Yeah. So you got to work on your, your accent and your, yeah, your sidecar. You park the car. You park the car in the yard. <laughs> That's right. Well, excellent. A uh, couple of quick announcements to get us started. Come to Embedded Device Security Assessments for the rest of us, a two-day hosted class at Black Hat Las Vegas, August 1st through the 2nd and 3rd through the 4th. You can register at the link in the show notes, or you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash IOT. That's right. Securityweekly.com forward slash IOT. Security Week listeners receive 10% off products in our store with the discount code IHackNaked. That's shop.securityweekly.com. Make sure you check out B-Sides Orlando, a community-driven event seeking to bring people together, anyone with a passion for making, breaking, protecting. That's right. It will be April 11th and 12th in Orlando, Florida. And uh, the third annual B-Sides Orlando, blah, 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 blah. Source Boston. Early bird pricing of $349 has been extended until March 31st. The full retail is $495 slash $595 at the door. The CFP also closes tonight at midnight. And Rob is guessing that they'll probably uh, not going to see an updink on CFP submissions four hours before the deadline, but you might. As someone could be listening to this live and go, oh, I want to submit a talk to Source Boston uh, and go ahead and do that. But uh, so get you your should. CFP it's, in. It's, it's, I did my Source, CFP. Source is a very cool, is a very cool event. I, um, it is. Unfortunately, I'll miss it again this year. I, I, last year was the first time I missed it, but it's a, it's a good balance. It, it's it's yeah. got the professionalism of a commercial conference. But it's got the the community feel of. Uh, it's got the tomfoolery that goes along yeah, with those of us from the community. It's, yeah, yeah, the usual suspects. Uh, 
Yeah. Anyway, good good show. I'm good glad comments. you know you some because he says the conference is committed to bringing business, technology, and security professionals together. You you sum that up nicely. Did I don't have to read Rob's marketing speak. You did it. You did that. Like form, I said, did, um, I've been involved since the first one, and uh, <laughs> some good stuff. Bummed I will miss it again. Our very. <coughs> Ooh, I've got to say, I'm looking. I'm looking forward to so, uh, no to B sides Orlando too, because I'm going to fly down for the Saturday to oh, be so B sides. Yeah, yeah. So. awesome. Yeah, they have hack naked stickers to give out to everyone. So make sure you go there and get your hack naked sticker and get on your your B sides Orlando. Um, B sides Tampa was recently, right? And, and Not that you should know wherever you. Uh, well, I was I was at B sides Tampa. You were there, okay? And B sides Tampa next year is I wasn't trying sure if something. We were ready. Yeah, I don't is know. Is trying if we wanna... something. And I'm glad somebody other than me is trying it. We've something we've <laughs> talked about, we've, and I a lot of us have talked about it. Yes. And uh, yeah, I'm glad somebody else is trying I, that one. I went to lunch with the organizer for B-Sides Tampa uh, to it, solidify my, my spot. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, <laughs> I have already committed to keynote a different B-Side, oh, so I will no. not be at that one. But they're All trying right. something cool, and like I said, I uh, hope they pull it off. I'm I excited. hope they pull it off, and I'm glad somebody else is trying it first. That's right. Um, <laughs> Yes. Okay, okay, I'm going to do a shameless plug. Uh, Black Hills will have a booth at B-Sides Orlando, so come by and see There you go. Good. Uh, so, who's, who, who can what? have a booth at B-Sides Tampa next year? Now, I, there's I, a I'm, thought. I want to have a booth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Russ uh, McCree I, is I'm going to be the booth babe. You know, well, <laughs> well, well if, you're at, well. if you're at RSA this year as a booth babe, you need to dress in uh, business, ca- business appropriate attire. Because they have finally uh, cracked down. Oh, they down. finally nixed the. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, now people mi- completely misunderstood this. People are saying, "What do you mean I can't wear shorts to the show?" It's like, no, it's about professionalism in the attire. Right. The RSA took a small step and cl- and changed the language, and people jumped on them. It's like the crowdsourced uh, track first year doing it. Uh, go out and vote, by the way, at the RSA thing. If you're going, if you're not going, vote for it. They're trying to do. They're trying to improve the conference based on feedback. First, you know, baby steps for a 30,000-person conference. I, wow. I know a lot of people like to hate it. I want you to think about running a 30,000-person conference and changing anything at all. So they're trying. Baby steps. Um, cut them some slack and pr- provide constructive criticism. I know I'm defending a, an, a, an event that a lot of people do not like, but if you make your living doing this stuff, um, it's kind of part of our game. I'm going to shut up now. Yes, we have a good guest. Like, we, we do. Should, Ru- we should we should talk about our guest. <laughs> Maybe even to him. Russ McCree is here with us. Russ, welcome to the show. Russ is uh, um, directs the security response and investigation team for Microsoft Operating Systems Group. He writes Toolsmith, a monthly column for the ISSA Journal, and has written numerous other publications on information security, including Insecure Magazine, SysAdmin, and Linux Magazine. Russ also speaks at events such as DefCon, DerbyCon, Blue Hop, Black Hat, Sandsfire, RSA, and is a SANS Internet Storm Center handler. Um, also, I thought it was interesting, Russ uh, it was on IBM's ISS X-Force uh, actually cited Russ as the sixth-ranked top vulnerability discoverers of 2009. Russ, welcome to the Security Weekly Show. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Yes. That, uh, that IBM piece is interesting because that is like, you know, the backstory is that's me going off as a script kitty with, uh, you know, basically burp and a bunch of vulnerable apps to find circa 2008, 2009, 2010, and it turned into a giant experiment. So it's kind of cool, though. It was... Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, th- dude. The great thing is that all those kind of low-hanging uh, bugs have been found and fixed. Mm. Well, and that's that's the beauty of it. You're right. They're just not out there as much as they were. They're still... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> what, what are we going to talk about <laughs> yeah. in the news for this week? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Russ, how did you get your start in information security? Uh did a career change in 02, having been basically just a business general manager, but always having, um, in essence, run my own technology. And I by no means consider myself a hacker in the true sense, but ultimately the, the premise of always trying to solve a problem using tech to do so and um, recognizing very quickly, even in late 80s, early 90s, that things were quite broken a lot of the time um, and reached a point in my career where with frustration uh, beyond words as a as a business manager, decided to literally take great risk, cut pay in half, take a contract job as a network security administrator for the uh, Seattle Police Department and jumped in and never looked back. And 
basically, um, you know, a lot of career building on the way, gathering a lot of experience and, and taking advantage of some extraordinary mentors on the way. Uh, and in a period of, you know, 13 ish years have, have done pretty well. So with uh, great thanks to a lot of folks on the way. So Russ, how did you uh, come to be a SANS internet storm center handler? Like when did that happen? So probably happened about three years ago and, um, you know, had been a participant in a lot of their training, you know, knew some of their folks, uh, knew Rick Warner, knew, uh, you know, sort of indirectly, but directly as well. I'd SCOTUS and, and some others and had, uh, contributed occasional pieces to certain articles and, and some findings and recognized it was something I wanted to do. There were, um, ironically, a uh, a couple of concerns specific to uh, you'll see it if you if you look. I decided to use um, a directory traversal attack as a uh, enumeration and discovery tool, hmm. <laughs> which got me into a little bit of trouble, a little bit of hot water where I was not, uh, you know, that was considered sort of a violation of um, shall I say, best practices as a certified SANS uh, certificate holder, if you will. And and so I had a bit of a delay becoming a handler based on uh, making sure I you know, was, in fact, not intending to be truly evil. And then once we got there, it was um, it was great because, you know, you do you do some trial um, diaries, if you will. They refer to them as diaries. And you, you spend some time interfacing with the other handlers. And it's turned into this just you know, boon of information and awareness with a sort of, um, it's a pretty global presence. People really look to the SANS diary as a, as a way to get sort of what they hope are first indicators for attacks. And it's, um, there's and some the, the handlers are, are global as well, correct? And global handlers as well, global, absolutely. Yeah. Following the sun, you've got folks, you know, in New Zealand and, and Europe and, um, the Middle East and uh, just extraordinarily bright, capable people from whom, you know, I've learned a great deal. Uh, you know, Mark Hoffman, Lenny Zeltzer, some of these guys are just, you know, extraordinary in their own right. So um, it's pretty humbling to be to be part of that. But it's cool because it was a natural transition from the um, spending a bunch of time writing, um, you know, my column and some of the articles I enjoy writing and sharing. It's a, it's almost a direct translation of that. So yeah. Kinda... Now, Russ, your your blog is called Holistic Infosec. What it, what do you mean by the term Holistic Infosec, and what's the kind of uh, vision behind that that name? Yeah, uh, about circa '05, working in you know city government, if you will, and recognizing that security problems are not um, single points; they're multifaceted, and that solving uh, infosec related issues, no matter what the, you know, the general topic is, is really a much broader holistic, uh, practice that's needed to do so. Uh, and so as an example, you know, I'm a huge advocate for life cycles. And when we think about the process of testing your defenses and your assumptions, you probably want to take a look at, you know, your monitoring pieces, your response pieces, your penetration testing pieces. How do they feed each other? Are you threat modeling? Are you following basic, simple best practices? And the the holistic mindset sort of came to fruition. So um, holistic infosec as a result is kind of the the namespace around the the principles. Uh, you know, and, so and, is that so? What's your full time job now? Do you like do you work for a company? Are you a consultant or? No, nope, I, I literally work for Microsoft. Um, mm -hmm. And if you will, it's a group of um, incident responders, uh, handlers. Um, investigators and then some, you know, what you might call a forensic, but more proactive forensics with the kind of the hunt mission in mind where, um, you know, seeking out the prospect of adversaries on your, on your network in a variety of forms. So and is that, uh, is that for Microsoft or that is for, for their Microsoft customers? at Microsoft? Okay. Yep. So you're, so that's, you're in charge of kind of the, the hunt part of a hunt. You mentioned the hunt, like hunt team processes at Microsoft. Correct. Uh, yeah, sort of hunt, respond, and uh, investigate, if you will, for what is one of the primary pillars of Microsoft, which is the operating systems group. So we have mm. um, Windows teams, the the mobile team, the Xbox team, um, and a number of others that uh, you know sort of are the underpinnings of those those major brands. So it's a it's a big scope. <laughs> so what are, what are some like what's your top three indicators to compromise on, on specific on Windows platforms? I would imagine, right? Well, I mean, I, you know, let me just caveat everything with all the uh, 
vague in certain ways, but um, it, it's more about agenda. Number one, are you looking at um, a true adversary on your network who you believe is, um, you know, there with the evil intent, whatever that oh, may be. Dare we and say APT? Dare we will not say it. Okay, I'm not don't. I'm, I'm, okay. not, I'm not doing RSA buzzword bingo today. <laughs> um, but the, you know, IOCs at their simplest are fine, but is there context to go with it? And I something I've always advocated for is thank you for a great big dump of blacklisted IP addresses or known bad mm -hmm. you know domain names. Those are relevant, but it's much more relevant when you measure uh, doing discovery of those against your own assets. And um, in essence, even if you know you can imagine uh, Microsoft, our uh, data pool is just vast beyond imagination. The network pipes are tremendous and the result is um you know you do some data sampling you do some some management to ensure you have good clean data but you've got to then measure against uh the threat intelligence for for context so it's very important for us to do that there's there's the premise that um you know, you're trying to protect data from getting out, and it may be inadvertent. I am uh, always a believer that no matter what the organization is, one of the first challenges is usually around um, <laughs> users, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, security misconfiguration. You know, it's it's often there's a reason uh, misconfiguration is now you know six on OWASP top ten. I think if I remember my list right, so it's it's. It's something that you always have to factor for. People make mistakes. So, um, yeah. How do you do configuration management on a scale such as Microsoft? <laughs> it's um, it's extremely difficult. It varies at times, to um, depending on the group. And as as you can imagine, Microsoft has uh, is embracing you know cloud services as much as mm -hmm. as we offer them. S scalability and manageability do become. Uh, in essence, you know, more convenient and more um, deliverable. And I, you know, to, sorry to go buzzword, but you know, the the speed and agility at which you need to operate is very much a factor. But can you um, can you generate giant data stores that become queryable again, depending on what might be as as you said, IOCs or might be uh, monitoring points of interests or specific asset buckets? You begin to um, define. You, you sort of have to prioritize and sort, right? So, you know, what do you what do you care most about, and you you protect and defend in 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 a manner that wraps additional layers. It's you know, back to simplistic. There's always the the premise of defense in depth. So you you have to define your assets first and foremost, and then and then build backwards. I know this all sounds somewhat uh, generic, but that's about as that's about as good as I could do for you. And, on Microsoft specific stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, it sounds like you're saying that you, you've got this infrastructure that's very vast and it's constantly changing, like many of us have. And if you're just focusing on one thing, such as configuration monitoring, that you're probably going to lose, right? You need to factor sure. in all those other things. That you, There is going to be a certain percentage of systems that you know they're going to go into production without the right configuration. And right. trying to be 100% efficient in that one area is probably not what we should be aiming for. True, and I and I believe, although it's hard to do again at scale, that you know one of the things I preach and advocate for is uh, understanding what is an expected baseline for behavior, not only for necessarily your users but your your systems themselves. If you mm -hmm. have a, a fairly good expectation of what your um, consumer peaks and valleys look like when the when the hours of you know, expected operation might be, you know, some of this, again, sounds oversimplistic, but the reality is those baselines can often help you spot what then might be anomalous. Um, and <laughs> again, believe it or not, machine learning actually does begin to play in here where, mm -hmm. um, you know, you are able to um, define what is expected and pivot against um, that which shows up, which is not expected. So, mm. even in a vast environment such as Microsoft, even in a vast environment, yeah. it's the only way to do it. I mean, you have to. It's, you know, it is, it is environment. It is, it, you know, public information. Of course, is that you know this is an environment that is in excess of a million servers. Um, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary. So, uh, it's great challenge. There's. You know, luckily, it's not all in one group. And again, as one of one of sort of four primary pillars, we have a we have a, if you will, a quarter of the interests. But mm. it's it's still a giant challenge. It kind of takes me to 
you know, one of the things I was thinking might be interesting to talk about with you guys and even get, you know, your views on this, but I'm always worried that people make the, um, assumption that because they have, and this is anywhere again, I'm not, I'll, I'll get out of being Microsoft specific here, but because you have a set of tools that you've maybe spent a, you know, a great deal of money for and, uh, and implemented, or you just, you know, you believe because you're using X tool that, um, you know, you're somehow better off and you're protected and everything's cool and you don't have anything to worry about. And, uh, I have struggled greatly even of late and, um, while conducting, um, shall we say, you know, in essence, participating in penetration tests outside of, uh, Microsoft that, you know, the, the broadly accepted, Hey, everything's cool because we have X deployed. is just, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to poke holes quickly in that. And folks get some pretty serious wake up calls when they, when they realize, Hey, just cause you spent hundreds of thousand dollars on, on a certain tool does not mean you're in, in great shape. And, you know, I, part of the holistic infosec mindset and the toolsmith mindset with how I write about these tools and these practices is exactly that to help people kind of get past the, Hey, don't just throw it in, but tune it, configure it, optimize it, make it useful, understand the data you're getting from it. You may be getting an extraordinary amount of data from it. And that, that is, you know, we were already talking about significant challenge in itself so yeah i think you know a lot of it russ i think comes down to goals right and i think a lot of people s misinterpret that they're like well i need to get this tool because it helps me with xyz and that's not really a goal like what's your goal for that tool what goal is that tool or that process helping you achieve and how does that fit into your overall picture and i think that's yep. where people kind of fall down they expect the tool to uh, set and achieve its own goals. And that, you know, goal achievement is, that's totally up to you. And that comes down to your configuring and using it in your own processes, for sure. You, you sort of touched on something interesting, and this traverses into um, some military experience, you know, even, even recently with, don't ask me for a specific item as part of uh, your needs, you know, while as a liaison officer, as an example, give me a mission. What is the scope of the activity you need to accomplish and at what period of time do you need to accomplish it? What's, and you said it very succinctly. What are your goals? You need to move X number of people from point A to point B. I'll tell you the right equipment. Don't, you know, don't dictate that to me. And that kind of mm. comes back very uh, similarly in an, in an information security venue. You know, I want to monitor egress traffic. I want to deploy, you know, application layer protections uh, in front of our web services. Cool. Well, here are the variety of ways you can do that. What's reasonable based on budget and, and time and skill set. So. Yeah, I mean, I get that. Obviously, I work for a vendor, right? So, you know, people uh, will say things like, well, I want to scan faster. I'm like, well, right. but let's put that in context, okay? So what are your goals? <laughs> what are you right. trying to scan faster? Why do you want the results faster? And what are you doing with the results? Are more pertinent questions than just, I want to scan faster. And I, I think that kind of speaks to the problem you hit on before, where people just want solutions, but they're not tied to achievable goals that are actually improving the security of the organization. Yeah. You, Paul, go Paul, ahead, John. You don't, you don't mind me interrupting. I, th there's, another, there's another aspect of that, which I think Russ hit on earlier, and that is the... Uh, the, the context, right? I mean, it's not just about what are your goals, but it goes back full circle to what's the baseline of the environment? What, what's the real understanding of the fundamentals of this environment that we can put that tool deployment into context so that when we are tuning and tweaking it and moving it forward, we're doing, it, doing that in an understanding way. We're doing that in an intelligent way that is adding value to the context of the environment rather than just turning on features, you know? Hmm. Amen, brother Jeff. Joff, sorry, Joff nailed that. That's, um, that's you know, and it's funny because when I look at the the list of tools I've written about over the years, specific to Toolsmith, you know, it's included work from Black Hills. It's included, you know, ADHD as part of our you know C three CM model. It's included, you know, the Pwn plug from Pony Express. I mean, this this small community. It is small. I mean, it sounds vast, and we talk about thirty thousand people shows like RSA. But at the end of the day, you know. Jack knows freaking everybody. 
Jack is Jack, <laughs> right? You know, and everybody knows him and Dave Kennedy. Everybody wants to hug Dave, you know, and, and the reality is almost we have. Almost everybody. Well, almost everybody. Within <laughs> yeah, reason. we do. We sometimes <laughs> regret it, though. <clears throat> I understand. Yeah, yeah. Especially when Dave, it's on camera. <laughs> and he has no shirt on. <laughs> yeah. oh. At least he wasn't in a kilt. <laughs> uh. oh. Oh. Wow, we far. digress. Really. See, we that's do. all it took was mentioning Dave Kennedy. We have a sound clip yep. for that, too. I don't know. If we can, <laughs> the wait, the naked hug or what? No, I'll not. I am the news. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's Dave. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, back you know, to back to context though, and to kind of talk about what Joff was talking about too. I see that in the sim and log management space. And I was just talking uh, with someone that I worked with before uh, the show. I said, you know, it's funny. I talked to a lot of people, and they're like, "Yeah, we run we run a sim. We run sim from big vendor, and right. wow, it does a great job of collecting all the logs, but." We've got this other sim-like tool that we actually use to analyze everything. But we have to collect everything because regulatory compliance says we have to have a year's worth of data. And by golly, that tool does a great job of collecting a year's worth of data. We don't really do anything with it. We use these other tools to actually do stuff, but we got to collect that year's worth of data. And to me, that's just – it speaks to one of the problems we have. Again, it comes back to context, Jock. we got all this data but no context around it, and now we're looking for other tools and processes to put context around it. You know, I think in, in my case, I was I was a little bit spoiled because I came into security uh, from an enterprise network architect perspective, and 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 you look at the the enterprise network architect space, and you have to have context in that space. You know all the moving parts. You know, you know what's DMZ two, what's DMZ five, what's the internal network X, and that kind of context is really critically important to have an intelligent response with all these add-on tools and 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 adding value to to your incident response processes and all the rest of it that goes along with the security space, you can't come at it cold. You've got to have an overall picture of what's going on in that environment. And I think you know the enterprise net, net, network architecture space gives you a really good overall picture of, of any one environment. And I think anybody coming in the incident response space or into, the, into, the, into that sort of position where they're managing some sort of appliance security solution – they need to get that perspective and that context of the environment before they're going to be able to do that job well. So, and then when you add the premise of this is something of, meaning one of our closest partners in response, ironically, is in fact our network security architect for that very reason. Because then, dependent you, your ability to respond to specific areas of higher value than others is dependent on understanding the assets in that mm -hmm. environment, how well it's protected, what are the mechanisms that are utilized to monitor it, et cetera. So all of that hooks back entirely. And two, though, it's about the customer in the middle of it and have they conducted, people laugh when I say this, everybody's so used to the concept of threat modeling from the perspective of, you know, oh yes, I threat modeled the software and we did static analysis on our code and everything's cool because, you know, it, it falls into line and we understand, you know, where privilege layers change and and access rights and data syncs, et cetera. But I, I asked them then, did you weigh all of that same set of principles against the infrastructure where your software is running? Yeah. And they are... You know, it's like, well, wait a minute. That doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Our, our software running on top of this infrastructure is it's wicked brilliant. secure, as we say here wicked in Rhode Island. Secure. But you're right. like, did you take into account what if someone right. owns the web server or the application right. server that's running your software? Like, what happens exactly. then? And they're like, uh, exactly. bad things? <laughs> bad things. Yeah. So, you know, that's back to that holistic picture the you know that right. threat model has to include those pieces and you can't do it without your subject matter experts like your network security architects couldn't couldn't have said that better on uh, on job's part so so uh, given that we have an evolving threat landscape and we try and do all these things to make things secure but what keeps you up at night yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, aside from diet mountain dew and destiny <laughs> yeah. the um, the uh, um, I will say, and again, this, my perspective is very, you know, that it's not necessarily, mind you, specific to, to Microsoft, but, um, you know, nation, nation state centric, um, attacks and in particular, the level of sophistication, um, that we 
I think clearly don't understand in full. I, I like to believe that I understand the, the skill sets and the capabilities of um, certain categories of attackers. But uh, at the end of the day, I'm also smart enough to know there are absolutely without equivocation um, skills and capabilities that we're not yet aware of. And uh, to what extent, if you, if you operate from the premise of, you know, there's a reason to hunt on your network and you operate on the premise that, um, it's reasonable to uh, assume breach in some form or fashion, um, that that's, that puts you behind an eight ball. It's, it's unfortunately Mm. beginning your thought process in a, in a negative light. Uh, and it does not make for a good sleep pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, uh, so it sounds like, it sounds like what keeps us up at night is the perspective of uh, false negatives. I'll take a false positive over a false negative any day. Right. True. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's fair. And, um, you know, but ironically, just to sort of you know, lay on the false positive concept, it's tough when you become ultra paranoid and you, you work with folks, no matter what the venue, who, who share that level of paranoia and you're trying to tune again at massive volume, you have, you have, uh, you're going to end up with a bunch of false positives and you don't, until you've proven otherwise, respond to them in any, any lesser fashion until you validate that you're, uh, in fact, Hey, this isn't what we thought it was, which is cool. But, um, I'm telling you, you know, fire drill reduction is my, one of my number one principles as a, as a responder is, you know, helping, helping senior people recognize too, Hey, I don't want you to pull the, you know, the panic button or push the panic button, pull whatever lever you're going to pull yet, because, uh, I really want you to understand facts and have substantive data before we, we go there. And sometimes that's hard because the, the, um, the tendency at times is to, to react and move quickly and make statements. And, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like, Hey, take it down a notch. Let's, let's get there. Practice. Mm -hmm. Practice calm first. So that's uh, don't panic. I have a don't panic on my, you know, the button right there, folks. Nice. Thank you. Nice. So it's um, the don't panic button. I guess. It is the don't panic button. So, uh, so Russ, where did you come up with the idea for the Toolsmith uh, blog? I, not being um, trained technically, my degrees in English, my, my background is largely self-taught again with with great mentoring but i recognized early on that one of the the best ways for me to learn how to become more proficient in in a particular method or with a specific tool is to literally write about it (laughs) is to you know sit down and work through a case study an actual scenario that then um teaches not only me how to do it but then sharing that with other folks allows them to hopefully, uh, benefit from the same practice I just went through. So with any given tool, it's, a, you know, here are the scenarios in which I'm thinking about using this. It's the, you know, the way to set it up, getting past some of the tricks and the, you know, the pitfalls that many tools have and getting them ready to go. And then, you know, running them through a case study in, in reasonably explicit manner, but, uh, you know, trying to do that in 1500 to 2000 words, a, mm. a pop, but it, you know, it's been, known as it been eight, eight ish years plus now. And, you know, I wouldn't call it uh, a spectacular, huge readership, but folks have expressed, um, you know, warm and, and fond thanks, you know, specific to the, to the columns and what it means to them, you know, each month. And I, uh, that's what matters to me. I don't really care if it's the greatest thing in the world. It's, it's, has somebody benefited and are they able to perform their job, uh, better as a function of having, you know, read something I've written. And if the answer to that is yes, and it's, you know, only one or two people at a pop, then that's great. It's, it's the same way I try to present when I, you know, go to shows and present. It's not to, you know, talk about the latest and greatest, you know, mad skill set I have. It's to go, here's how to, you know, do this for yourselves. You should take this back to your organizations and, and put it into practice if you can. So, And so you chose a Toolsmith Tool of the Year for 2014. How did you go about that process? I let I literally let the readers vote. Nice. Um, and it's just a, you know, it's a typical survey mechanism um, posted on the blog and, and folks get to zoom in and, and vote as they see fit. And we try to use a, a 
service that doesn't allow, you know, horribly fraudulent voting. So it's a pretty realistic snapshot. And, you know, on a good year, we'll get a thousand plus people who, who have decided. Yes. And I'll tell you what, though, this year was a surprise. It was um, Simple Risk, which is yeah, what a is tool put, risk? right? Exactly. A tool put together by a gentleman named uh, Josh Sokol. And Simple Risk basically oh, allows you. Oh, yeah. You know Josh. It's, yeah. He goes back yeah, to you know everyone. Josh. Exactly. Yeah, Josh, Austin, Central Texas area, web app, yep. that sec guy, active in OWASP and all sorts of things in Central Texas and beyond. Wow, wow Jack really does know everyone. <laughs> hey, that's like freak show, dude. <laughs> that was like literally dictionary Josh Sokol, so he should be proud. He'll, I'll tell him to come back and look at this. But um, that the reality is, yeah, he's a great PHP dev, and he he's in a role where to do – proper risk management for his organization. He was losing his mind using spreadsheets like so many of us do and uh, wrote down, uh, you know, created, wrote down his ideas and then created, a, you know, a framework within the context of his skill set, which was PHP web app development and um, has now achieved a level of capability that is, you know, you can buy support and, and deploy it, um, in enterprise workspaces to help you, you know, identify, classify, sort, uh, segment and prioritize risks in a very granular manner. Uh, so it's actually, you know, even though risk management may not be the sexiest thing in the world, it's, it's really well done. So, and again, it's something that I, I, if you'd said to me at the beginning of the survey, you know, the, the readers are going to pick the, the risk management tool. Yeah. Uh, I would have said, wow, you know, <laughs> probably not, but you know, it's, uh, you know, like I, from the same period of time, I, and this isn't by any means to say Josh doesn't fully deserve it, but some of the stuff that I loved is just like, uh, like honey drive, which is the an incredible collection of, of honeypot tools all in one distribution. Um, just a, just an awesome distro. So, you know, I had a ton of fun deploying that thing. Um, nice. so for me, it would have, I would have gone there, but that's not, you know, it's not for me to decide, but let the people decide. Right. So, uh, what, what's coming up next on the, the toolsmith blog? I, th I think we're going to go with uh, recall this coming month. And, and one thing that folks can, you know, as they're watching or come back and, and see this later, I am always open to suggestions. I don't necessarily ask for it a lot, but when I have, it's been usually pretty fruitful. But um, I've spent sort of two months in a row heavy in the pen test space because it's I'll also, it'll, I'll say this, my columns sometimes will follow what I'm actually doing in, yeah, absolutely. in real world in a given period. So it, it tends to lay out at the same time. But um, Recall is a, if you will, a volatility fork, the memory analysis framework that um, allows for a little more um, real-time memory analysis mm -hmm. than, than volatility itself does. And I, uh, there's a few reasons why that's really important from a, you know, you have X amount of time to conduct a, a valid response and investigation. So mm -hmm. sure. gonna, I think we're going to go there. Sweet. Uh, anything you want to uh, announce for us? Are you speaking at any upcoming conferences or... I am not. I've uh, this year um, kind of stepped back a bit from cons just because of uh, some uh, focus areas for the for uh, Washington's military department. Um, and that's keeping me kind of busy. And I, you know, imagine it's a, it's a it's a body of work that allows us to help uh, better protect um citizens and the agencies that that protect them um and serve them so uh it's you know it's good stuff that again i can't be terribly specific about but it's i've kind of committed myself pretty heavily to that this year so not doing any cons but um i I was going to say Doug, uh, Doug Burks would love to have me come do B-Sides Augusta mm. <laughs> in September, but uh, unable to travel at the same time, but to trying to get him some folks to, to head over there. Uh, I will go do the uh, ISSA regional conference for um, Boise in um, May. That's probably the, the big one coming up, but I've got a keynote there. But, um, and I, you know, one of the shows, I don't know, Jack, have you been to Sandsfire, the, the one in D.C.? I have not That's been the, in, in years. I haven't been in years either. It's, you know, I, I think it's, 
it probably hasn't changed a whole lot. The size maybe is, you know, it's a probably bigger show, but that one I, I love, and I love going and speaking there just because again, it's, it's usually specific to something, um, you know, that I've picked up on as, as part of handler duties and the presentation material just crosses over perfectly. And sometimes it's so us top 10 or, you know, command control and countermeasures of your digital adversaries. It's, you know, it's a wonderful way to express some of that stuff. So, um, if, if folks who are particularly keen on the SANS community are looking for a show, that's to me, that's the one just because it's the handlers themselves coming and doing a lot of presentations and in addition to all the, the regular training. So shout out to the SANS diary. So cool. I'm trying to break Paul's head by you making are. him read something. I know I can't. I, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm ready because I'm ready to do five questions. Russ, ready oh, for yeah, five yeah, questions? We, we, ready for five questions. <laughs> <laughs> Three words to describe yourself. Persistent. Hmm. I think I would go with persistent, and I and I use this in a non. I know now I'm saying multiple words. I like to use the word bright, but not because I believe I'm highly intellectual, but just because my level of engagement and commitment to a thing is sort of a bright approach. Um, and then um, very consistent as well, and that comes back to so persistent bright consistent if you were a serial killer what would be your weapon of choice Ooh, i will go with a six hour sp22 nice oh very specific very specific yeah. i like it if you wrote a book about yourself what would the title be about myself oh. that's it there's the title right there yeah <laughs> it's a good title um, i like it don't panic Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Leonard Nimoy and Meryl Streep. <laughs> In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Oh, uh, I'm going to take first on that one. Excellent. Russ McCree, thank you very much for appearing on Security <laughs> Weekly. Thank you, Russ. <laughs> thank you, sir. We look Appreciate forward it. to your incident uh, handling on the on the Sands incident handling blog. So, yep. In fact, good. I believe I've got a shift coming up. Literally, if it's not already rolled over, it's coming up this afternoon. So, excellent. Well, appreciate it, guys. Drink in preparation for that. And we'll, see you later. <laughs> we'll see you later. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Russ. Thank you, Russ. Cheers. Cheers. Take care. Cheers. With that, we're going to take a short break. Come back with our stories for this week. Make sure if you're in the live stream, you pay attention. I think we're going to do a live cocktail feed. We might. That sounds dirty, I know. but He said cocktail. <laughs> Uh, what are we? What are we doing? Let's let. I'm, I'm poorly prepared. Let's let's. Do we, do we have hey, why, like rye over there? I could. Well, I could just, just throw some Sazerac. Got a little of this and some bitters and I this. Throw and some, some shake it up and Sazeracy things back. happening. I need All to right. see you guys. I can't, I can't. I've got to see the cocktail mixing. It's it's, it's bothering me. It's, All right, know. we'll we'll work on that during the break. So with that, take a short break. Come right back. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. All right. Yay, Barbara. 